right? Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris and I have spent a lot of time uh, wandering around with these people, actually. We were in London visiting Julian Assange about a month or two ago, and I remember Chris ended his, on, his article in a remarkable way. There's a hotel around the corner from the Ecuadorian embassy uh, called the Cadogan Hotel. And I, of course, just being a regular person, would have no idea that that had any significance other than being a hotel. Chris ends his article by after he visits Julian Assange for a day and a half or so, walking by the Cadogan, and then writing about, who's the poet? Oscar No, the Oscar Wilde, but who wrote the poem about it? Uh, okay, yeah. but that's the hotel where, in 1890-something, Oscar Wilde was arrested um, for being gay. And it's room 118 in the hotel, and so Chris contrasts Oscar Wilde sitting in his hotel room at the Cadogan, and then Julian Assange uh, sitting in the room at the uh, Ecuador, Ecuador Embassy. So uh, we've had an interesting time. I won't tell you the stories about when I first met Jeremy Hammond, um, I, I just interviewed Chris about his new book, Days of Destruction. And so, because I didn't know Jeremy at all, I didn't really know much about his politics. So I mentioned to Jeremy, I just came from interviewing uh, Chris about, about his new book. He says, Chris Hedges, He's the one who wrote that article about the black bloc uh, during Occupy. And I didn't like that article at all. So I started <laughs> off completely on a bad foot uh, with, with uh, Jeremy Hammond. Uh, but all those kind of stories. And then uh, I like when Cade spoke about the FBI. You know, we had a lot of resistance to the FBI in the 70s during the grand jury period, late 60s and 70s, particularly. And then in the Puerto Rican movement as well. And you know, basically, you didn't talk to the grand jury. You didn't talk to the FBI. And we always used to tell our clients, of course, call us first, and we'll talk to the FBI, and we'll get what we can out of what the investigation is, and then you know, we'll give you a choice, but we can tell you that generally it's not a good idea to talk to the FBI. And then you know, some people think they're smart enough, they have nothing to hide, they can talk to them. And we used to have this expression, talking to the FBI is like eating potato chips. Um, once you start, uh, you don't stop. You essentially become an informant uh, for the FBI. Uh, so was, uh, was glad. Uh, Cade uh, mentioned that. Uh, but I want to talk about this idea of struggle that you ended with and Chris's point about uh, prosecution and uh, what the government is doing to push people back so heavily. Um, I was actually last night, I was, last, when did I come here? I took a flight here last night from London. Um, so I was with Julian yesterday and we were talking exactly about this question of the government's sledgehammer against whistleblowers. Uh, really putting them in prison, whether it's Jeremy Hammond, or Barrett Brown, uh, or Chelsea Manning, uh, or others who are in prison or around the world. And Assange's view is that this struggle is not at all lost, but in fact it's going on heavily. And one of his purposes and one of ours should be to say um, the government, despite its sledgehammer, is not deterring people from coming forward, whistleblowing, and taking on the government. <clears throat> And they're very strong about that issue. And you know, I'll, I'll get to this, but WikiLeaks did something extraordinary with regard to Ed Snowden. They actually helped Ed Snowden go from Hong Kong uh, to Moscow. And a woman who I'll talk about, who I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a woman named Sarah Harrison? Mm -hmm. um, you will after I finish this. Um, <laughs> uh, but he talks about the fact that he in that embassy is still functioning at a very high level, despite the government's incredible repression of him. I, that's what I do here. I look at that grand jury. I look at what we think is a secret indictment for espionage against uh, a publisher and editor, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, and despite that kind of repression, he is still functioning as an organization. Uh, Ed Snowden is not in a prison uh, in the United States, uh, despite incredible efforts by the government uh, to get him. Um, and those are examples uh, that Assange puts forward and that I'm putting forward as a way in which um, you don't actually, just because you're a whistleblower, have to necessarily wind up in prison. Now, obviously, we've learned a lot uh, as we've gone through this scenario in the last few years of how not to do that. Um, but I think it's important to understand just because the government is hitting people with sledgehammers, uh, it doesn't mean uh, that we shouldn't have people coming forward uh, and, and being truth tellers. And I think Ed Snowden's a very good example. Ed Snowden came forward, you understand, after Chelsea Manning uh, was already indicted and facing life in prison for espionage. Um, she hadn't received her sentence at the time, um, but in fact, uh, she was facing that, and despite that, uh, despite that, Ed Snowden uh, came forward. And, and that reminds me of some of the vulnerabilities here 
uh, that the internet, despite the ability of the United States and other governments to spy on everything we do, and I'll talk about that in a second, it has vulnerabilities. One of them is all their secrets are online. All the stuff that I've spent my life trying to get out, from torture at Guantanamo uh, to killing people with drones, you can get those, or someone can get them online. Um, and that's what the government doesn't want. They don't want us getting those, so they're gonna hit people with sledgehammers. But that's a huge vulnerability, and we've seen it come out. We've seen it come out with what Chelsea Manning released, uh, with what um, Jeremy Hammond released, and particularly, of course, recently, with what Ed Snowden released. So despite the ability of the US and other countries to do what they can with the internet, spying, digitization, and all of that, it has that vulnerability. The second vulnerability is one that I was hearing a lecture by Julian Assange uh, at a meeting I was at. He was on one of those big screens. And it's on a Sunday, and it's before we know Ed Snowden's name. We know some of the material because that was leaked before we knew it was Ed Snowden. Assange gets up there and he says, look, they're running this massive surveillance system. Um, there's, they have to hire thousands and thousands of people. And what do you think those people's ages are? Do you think they're people like me? Absolutely not. I don't know that, I, I can, yeah, I can use the computer, but I can't do what Jeremy <laughs> Hammond and others can do. They're gonna be people under 30. Um, and the more people they hire, the thousands under 30, the more vulnerable they're gonna be. Because those people are not gonna share the politics of the government or the companies they're working for. They may be over here, they may be anarchists, they may be libertarians, they may be liberals, they may be leftists, but they're not gonna share the government and they're gonna come out more and more and more. So built into this surveillance state um, is actually tremendous, uh, tremendous vulnerability. Uh, in some way, I think we're in the, in the, in the midst of what I, uh, very lucky in a way, uh, to be alive to see what's going on right now because we're really in an incredible struggle with the government and corporations on the one side uh, and the people on the other. And the government and corporations want to basically control the internet from a vertical point of view. They want to control it entirely. Uh, we want to democratize it and have it on a horizontal level. So that's one of the things that we're struggling about. The second thing we're struggling about is the massive surveillance uh, they're engaged in. And let's not underestimate the danger. You know, I'm, I'm interested in one of the questions uh, is why we didn't have more people in Washington at the demonstration uh, against surveillance a few weeks ago and what is wrong with the American public in terms of how they're looking at this and opposing it. I don't have the answers, I'm just, I'm just posing it. Um, but we should recognize what the dangers are. And I'm thinking not just about the fact that they know who my doctors are and you know, what I do with my life, but I'm thinking more about Occupy Wall Street, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Let's say tomorrow, all of a sudden, we begin to get some kind of uprisings in a place like Saudi Arabia. Um, what do you think our government has right now? They have complete nets and trees of every single activist in that country, who their friends are, and who can be picked up the next day. So one of the huge dangers to me of what's going on is over ultimately um, forming and changing, changing the manner in having revolutions, changing our governments, uh, because this surveillance system, in the end, uh, apart from our, my own privacy, uh, can be used as an incredible means of, of spying and stopping activism. In the end, of course, I've, as I've always thought about spying, in the end, when it comes and it unfolds, nothing can stop it. Um, but they can stop it on the way as it begins to grow. A third, a third part of the surveillance, and I don't think the United States has given, government or the press has given a fair, um, a fair look at it, um, is what's really going on. Is this spying really about, oh, you know, spying, getting all my metadata on my phone call or my internet, um, or is it about something else? And if you read the articles carefully, it's really about politics and economics. Um, a lot of it is about wanting to know what other governments are doing, our own allies and others, so we can play chess with them and basically continue our uh, hegemon hegemonic uh, control of the world and our economic control. So we're spying on Petrobras, which is the oil company in Brazil. Um, what's that about? Uh, that's not about terrorism. That's not about anything except US empire and control of economic resources around the world. That's what I want to see much more written about. Um, that's what I don't see written about. Uh, that's what's going on. Now, in any of these kinds of struggles, um, 
we have our heroes. And I want to talk about that and then I'll uh, conclude briefly. Some of the people, um, and it's a long list. Um, you know, I knew Aaron Swartz. I guess most of you probably know who Aaron Swartz is. He committed suicide over uh, really a government prosecution of him uh, for uploading you know, a certain number, of maybe a quarter million just or documents onto a computer. They charged him with a dozen acts of computer fraud and abuse act, facing 35 years. And ultimately, as the young man he was, genius he was, um, he couldn't, uh, couldn't apparently deal with it and committed suicide. So Aaron would be one. Um, Chelsea Manning, Chris and I were at that trial together a couple of times, I think. And that's one of the most moving experiences I've had in my life. I heard uh, Chelsea describe uh, when she was tortured um, in prison, and it was incredible to see the dignity she had and her ability to talk about it. I heard her when she pled guilty, um, and when she talked about every single thing she revealed and the political motivation uh, for why she did, why she did it. Uh, so Chelsea is another, uh, another one of our heroes. Uh, Julian Assange is sitting in the embassy, still operating. Uh, Jeremy Hammond, uh, and I want to encourage people to not forget it, November 15th, next week, 10.30 uh, in the morning. Pearl Street downtown. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. That's the rally. Okay, nine o'clock is the nine. rally. Ten thirty is the um, is the here is the sentencing hearing. Get yourself there. Uh, support Jeremy Hammond uh, in every way you can. In the sentencing letter I wrote for Jeremy Hammond, what I said is, uh, what he did was show us that what's going on in this country is not just about government surveillance, which is what I've been litigating my whole life, but it's probably a majority about corporate surveillance. Something like 80% of the surveillance in this country um, is with probably government agencies, from the NSA to everybody else, but it's done by private corporations. 10 years ago, there were perhaps 100 private corporations doing it. Today, today there are thousands. And then, of course, you have uh, Barrett Brown, who's sitting in prison, facing 105 years for pasting a link uh, into a chat room. And then you have the journalists. Glenn Greenwald sitting arguably in at least hopefully temporary exile in Brazil. Laura Quattras sitting in temporary exile, I hope, um, in Berlin. And then you have uh, the person whose letter I want to mention today, a woman named Sarah Harrison. Sarah Harrison is the woman who accompanied Ed Snowden from Moscow, um, from uh, Hong Kong to Moscow, and helped prepare um, his asylum applications to 21 countries, stayed with him in Moscow, um, for four months until he was settled um, and should be uh, one of our incredible heroes. And I want to, um, I'll read you a couple of paragraphs and then recommend highly the letter to you. Uh, she begins an open letter she wrote today when she finally got into Berlin. And it's not clear at all she can go back uh, to London because as I think it was Chris said, right now national security journalism is considered to be uh, terrorism in London, espionage here, terrorism in London. Uh, that's what Miranda, uh, Glenn's partner, is being investigated for. That's very likely what would happen to Sarah Harrison, who's a UK citizen, uh, if she went back, uh, if she went back into uh, London. She begins her letter. <laughs> As a journalist, I have spent the last four months with NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden and arrived in Germany over the weekend. I worked in Hong Kong as part of a WikiLeaks team that brokered a number of asylum offers for Snowden and negotiated his safe exit from Hong Kong to take up his legal right to seek asylum. Now, I don't know what the legal liability is for that, uh, but I have to say that the decision that was made uh, by Assange, WikiLeaks, and Sarah Harrison um, put them into a situation that I got asked on a show the other day, well, Michael, it's one thing to defend a, a publisher and a journalist. Isn't it something else to defend someone who's actually perhaps aiding and abetting uh, Ed Snowden? Uh, so they took a very, very principled position, the position being that you should not abandon your sources. That's the position they took about Chelsea Manning, the position about Jeremy Hammond, and the position um, that the Guardian and the New York Times ought to take about Ed Snowden, but they don't. They get their sources, and then they just let them go. Um, but that's not the way it ought to be. They ought to protect, uh, protect their sources. Uh, I'll end with the way um, Sarah uh, ended her letter. In these times of secrecy and abuse of power, there is only one solution, transparency. If our governments are so compromised, 
that they will not tell us the truth, then we must step forward to grasp it. If our governments will not give this information to us, then we must take it for ourselves. And her last paragraph, which is really moving, when whistleblowers come forward, we need to fight for them, so others will be encouraged. When they are gagged, we must be their voice. When they are hunted, we must be their shield. When they are locked away, we must free them. Giving us the truth is not a crime. This is our data, our information, our history. We must fight to own it. Courage is contagious. Thank you. So,